Justin, in trying to discern the cognitive underpinnings of the development of human culture, uh, normally it's the province of cultural anthropologists, uh, cultural evolutionists, uh, sociologists. Um, what can be the contribution of a cognitive psychologist who basically works on individuals, not the collection of them? Yeah, good. Great question. Um, it does seem like you'd think the study of culture is something anthropologists ought to do and they ought to. Uh, but what the anthropologists are really good at providing is uh, the broad sweep of the data set that need to be accounted for. And when we talk about culture, we're talking about the distribution of um, thoughts, behaviors, artifacts that come from those thoughts and behaviors, all of that stuff. And I say distribution, that's important. If I do something by myself, we wouldn't call that cultural. We'd call that maybe idiosyncratic. Um, if a certain type of behavior or a certain idea doesn't stabilize in a population, we might call that a fad. We wouldn't normally call that culture. So when we're talking about cultural phenomena, we're talking about distributed behaviors, ideas, practices that have some kind of stability in a population. Well, which ones do that and why is a question that a cognitive science approach can contribute to. A cognitive uh, approach can identify what are the mechanisms by which we transmit those ideas to each other so that they can spread. So uh, we might examine imitation and what is it about human minds that makes us really good at imitating each other. Or maybe select who it is that we're going to imitate from because we don't just imitate everybody. We need to make decisions about who's most strategic to imitate or learn from. How do we teach? How do we learn from each other? Those are cognitive processes. But on top of those dynamics that help ideas spread, just in a bland general way, it seems that some ideas just sort of, once they get to us, they kind of get, get a hold of us a little bit more. They have like hooks in our brain or something like that. There's another contribution for cognitive approaches is, what are the sort of natural propensities we have in thinking? in entertaining ideas, in generating new ideas that make some candidates for culture more attractive than others. All of these are cognitive contributions. What kind of an experiment would be designed to uh, uh, explore that question? The kinds of uh, cultural uh, changes that would have a, uh, a stickiness with the cognitive process of individual minds? Well, an example that um, comes from cognitive science of religion, that area of cultural expression might be something like, well, we could look at children and how they acquire religious concepts, for mm -hmm. instance, and compare that to how they're acquiring concepts of, say, their mother. So uh, my research group, we've looked at uh, three, four, five, six-year-old children in how they think about other people's minds. So mom's mind, a dog's mind, God's mind, an angel's mind. And we do this through sort of garden variety cognitive developmental tasks, like uh, false belief tasks is a, a very famous kind of task where you present children with a, some kind of a container that they don't know what's inside of it. And you ask them, well, do you know what's in here? And uh, there are variations on this. The latest one we've been doing, we keep them in the dark about it. Do you know what's inside this container? No. Would your mom know what's inside the mm -hmm. container? Would a dog know? Would God know? Would an angel know? Or the Virgin Mary? Or Santa Claus? We can ask about all kinds of things. And what we can see from those types of studies is, well, how do children develop from three to say six years old in their understanding of mom's mind? And in some cultural contexts, they have this tendency to over-attribute to mom. Right. Oh yeah, mom would know what's in there. How could she possibly know? Oh yeah, mom would know. But by the time they're about six, ah, mom wouldn't be so yeah. sure. Well then, does that parallel how they think about God? Is there something about the way that their understanding of minds helps scaffold their acquisition of God concepts? Mm. In this con context, yeah, it kind of looks like they do because thinking about other minds as being sort of having special access or super knowing seems to be actually pretty easy for young kids. Mm. They get God right before they get their mom right on these kinds of tasks. My daughter, when she was maybe five or six, drew a picture of her mother with one eye. And, and we said, well, why did you do one eye? And she says, that's all she needs to know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs>
so. Oh, the all-seeing eye <laughs> yeah, of mom. Yeah. I think another time was the eye was at the back of the head. <laughs> so, uh, so and then what is the translation from the individual um, uh, recognition of, of God in this developmental thing, just to take that as an example, and, and seeing that pervasively in a culture? So the idea here is that if ideas are really easy to acquire or maybe even generate in an individual level, then they're more likely to show up again and again in a population. And humans are really uh, attracted to well, conformity, it's called, right? I mean, we've got this, what's called conformity bias, that we tend to believe things that everybody else is believing. We tend to think things that everybody else is thinking. If we hear an idea come up over and over again, it gets sort of a prima facie credibility to it. So ideas that are really good to think are also more likely to be believed. Yeah, and, and if we look at the distribution of religions in the world, it's and, and uh, based on the percentages of uh, of Christian and Hindu and Buddhist and Judaism, whatever. Uh, I mean, they're not that percentage not evenly spread over the whole world like you know thin jam. Uh, they're very heavily concentrated in very specific areas, and that would seem non-accidental. <laughs> yes, it would seem non-accidental. No, the suggestion is not that cognitive approaches exhaust uh, the kinds of approaches for explaining cultural distributions, but they provide kind of the background mm -hmm. conditions uh, against which bigger social historical forces can work. But, but what's the stuff that the sort of social and historical kinds of forces work upon? It's this basic cognitive stuff.